and click oh, on record and do my job and zoom out. Good. So, uh, yeah, only very warm welcome to the topic three learning in communities, networked collaborative learning. Um, yeah, as you know, we Alexandra Mihai is from the University of Maastricht and she is a very experienced expert in learning in communities. Uh, but I think no more words from my side. And uh, please, Alexandra, introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit more about your thoughts and your work. Thank you Thank very you. much, Alexandra and Jörg, for the invitation. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you uh, today. A little bit more on why I'm related to this topic. So I'm indeed an assistant professor currently at Maastricht University uh, in the Netherlands. But before that, I worked in universities in Belgium, in Germany and the UK. So I toured Europe, let's say, and the US a little bit on, a, on an exchange last year. Um, so I do know quite a bit about different systems and different universities in and a bit outside Europe as well. Uh, and um, my, my interests um, range from general higher education topics, organization of higher education, uh, structures, procedures, and so on, currently focusing on centers for teaching and learning, um, to actually more uh, learning design related topics um, with a focus on technology, use of technology, and uh, active learning, uh, including and uh, specializing in problem-based learning, because at Maastricht University, this is the signature pedagogy. So um, if you read about Maastricht University, it's always linked to problem-based learning. Now, the way, well, PBL can mean a lot of things. You are doing uh, um, one version of it, uh, quite, from what I heard, quite a, uh, you know, a pure version, but uh, a lot of the times, uh, this can also mean different things for different people, even within our university. So I wouldn't say it's a very homogeneous concept. Um, nevertheless, there are some very important things that that are there all the time. So this student-centeredness, the, 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 the um, active uh, involvement of students throughout the process, and even student, I would say, self-directedness. Uh, so they have to really decide and work on their objectives, uh, as you know, quite well. So I'm doing all those things um, in along three pillars. So my job involves three pillars. I do research, I do teaching, and I do educational development, faculty development. So these are sort of equal, let's say, or at least in theory, they are equal. Now, how much I can do that in practice uh, equally, it's always a challenge, but I do like that I have all of them in my portfolio because they build on each other and they I could I can create quite a lot of synergies. So, you know, while doing PBL and teaching PBL, I can also train other teachers in PBL and also even uh, do research on it. So that's quite uh, that's quite nice. Um, the learning community link is a is a bit more personal, so I am very fond of this idea, and I became a fan of it, especially during the pandemic, um, a lot on online and on Twitter and 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 LinkedIn and so on. Um, got to meet a lot of interesting people uh, whom I otherwise I would have never met, and I felt closer and I felt more uh, I, I felt richer due to those communities uh, sometimes than due to or or thanks to the people that were really physically around me. So I do appreciate this sort of learning communities. And on those two topics, we're going to touch upon today. And I'm going to share my screen. And I hope it will work well. Um, just going to do full screen. I hope you can see it. Yep. OK, perfect. Um, so yeah, today we're going to talk, uh, or ho hopefully we'll have quite an interesting uh, discussion because I'm always willing to and happy to learn more about those topics too, um, about two aspects. So of course, network collaborative learning can be seen as one topic, but I chose to sort of unpack it a little bit. Um, and uh, we will focus uh, first part on the collaborative learning aspect um also how you can you know with some tips on how you can design collaborative learning activities how you can implement them with your students um and with a, also uh, focusing on how you can use technology for that of course since we are in this environment um and the second part will be uh, more on learning communities 
again, what do they mean for your teaching with your students, but also for us as teachers, so faculty learning communities. And I'm hoping after each part, we can have a little bit of a discussion um, and I'll have some interactive moments as well. So I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to your, uh, to your input there as well. So without further ado, let's go into the first part. And this is one definition of collaborative learning, but of course, collaborative learning can mean and means for each of us something different. But I think again, beyond labels and definitions, I think the most important thing is you know, use of small groups or groups of students or teachers uh, that work together in order to maximize each other's learning. So it brings an added value to learn. Um, now, we also have different terms you can you hear, and sometimes they are used interchangeably, but sometimes we need to separate them. Um, group work is quite often uh, um, one of them. Now, I, I think in many regards, they can be similar or they have a similar meaning, uh, but collaborative learning for me, it's a little bit more sustainable. So really learning like you do in your groups on and on week after week for a longer period. Group work can also be, you know, you, you are in a big lecture and every now and then we have two, three uh, tasks where you have to work with your with your neighbor or with the two people around you. Uh, so I, in my in my opinion, at least in my view, the, the sustainability aspect and the longer term and maybe sometimes more structured aspect of it um, can be can be labeled as collaborative learning but uh, as i said it does mean different things uh for different people uh, and it also has of course an, an active aspect in it as i said because we put it under this bigger uh, picture of uh, active uh, student-centered learning but as i said it can mean various things and it can also be interpreted differently and this versatility is something that speaks in its favor actually um, so we have, uh, we can encounter formal or more informal ways of doing it. As I said, it can be really formal, like you have in this course. It's very good that I can always give this example. So really a whole course or a course you're teaching could also be an example where students get to work week after week, sometimes in the same groups, sometimes in different groups, but there is a structure, there is a formal aspect to it. And often there is also an assessed element to it, but we're going to get back to that later. Um, but that doesn't need to be the only way of collaborative learning. There are lots of informal ways as well. So, you know, um, learning together on, on a topic in the cafeteria or meeting in the park and, and, and continuing something maybe from the classroom or just taking initiative and working on something together, uh, you know, finding similar interests and working on something together. Um, so again, the idea here is that like any form of learning, collaborative learning is also not bound or shouldn't be bound in between four walls, either that is a classroom or home or, you know, it's it happens as a flow inside and outside the formal structures and buildings. Um, second point, of course, it's linked to that as well. So it can be more structured. Usually the more formal uh, part uh, of it is also uh, the one that is more structured. Um, so, you know, uh, clear group setup, uh, regular meeting times, um, you know, those, those sort of uh, structures that you can, uh, clear outputs, um, these, these are forms of structuring the collaborative work, but it's not less collaborative if it happens more spontaneously, more ad hoc. And this is also linked to the informal aspect that I mentioned before. Sometimes they, are, they go together. You have a formal structure um, in which students work on a project, let's say for like a month or two, uh, but in between they will also meet informally. And sometimes they might want to meet external actors to help them in their process and so on. So there are lots of it, it you can't really see learning as a as a straight line it's it's a it's sometimes a very winding line or different paths going in different directions maybe then converging so I, I that's what i want to showcase here that it's not about um you know uh one way uh of doing it you can it can be done in different ways also the length of activities uh, and and they can also coexist that's a good thing so it's not either or um Again, according to how you design it and the purpose of it, because behind all these choices, and that this is what I'm going to focus on today, has to be a meaningful design decision. 
Why do we even do collaborative learning? How do we explain that to students? Uh, how we manage it, how we assess it and so on. So there is this intentionality behind it. And this will be really the core, let's say, of my of, of my input today. Uh, so all these, this, all these things you see on the, on the screen here are, are decisions. Uh, even if you choose for both, it's decisions you need to make intentionally when you design the, the um, activity. So again, short and long, of course, the long ones are more structured, usually the short more ad hoc, but it, again, they can coexist, as I said before. Um, and the versatility is obvious from all those things that I just mentioned. Um, also the versatility in terms of which aims of the course you can help, you can have collaborative uh, learning contribute to. Uh, so again, like we know, like I, I'm sure uh, all of you know about backward design. So you start with the goals in mind and then you choose assessment methods and learning activities accordingly to align a constructive alignment i'm sure you're aware of the concept so in also in this line of, of constructive alignment we have to think according to our goals why are we using collaborative activities and there can be many many uh, examples and maybe some of you will come up with that in in a, in a discussion but i think the core of it also is that it's more authentic uh, uh, because it's not just sitting in a classroom and listening. First of all, the students have a more active role, but also like often is the case with problem-based learning, you are also tackling problems. You're starting from a problem rather than starting from the theory. So it's a more authentic way to learn because it replicates quite well what happens in real life and what students will be faced with after uh, they graduate. So we are modeling that, we are training them, we are helping them develop skills as well as knowledge. That's also what I like about collaborative learning, that is not only about the knowledge, but it's a lot about the skills development as well. And that's something we should be more explicit about. We are often not explicit enough, um, even though sometimes a lot of our courses and our activities help students develop their skills, be it teamwork, presentation, critical skills. It's We're not putting them to the forefront enough. And I think probably we should, but that's a topic for a different webinar. So before I get into the more intentional design um, part, uh, I wanted to uh, ask you um, to go to this, uh, to go to this um, address. Uh, I will also show a code, but I first let you maybe, uh, or maybe if we can put it in chat, I'm trying to see if we can do that easier. Um, just different ways of showing it because there are lots of uh, there are lots of ways, but let's do it in chat. Um, and uh, I will also show the code just in case um, you you um, uh, want to participate like that. Uh, is everyone in already? Do people have problems getting in? Okay, perfect. Then we're going to go to the first question. And what I would like you to think about is in from your perspective. So again, start from your perspective, your own experience with collaborative learning. In a word or in a short phrase, what do you think are the benefits? What is it good for? What does it do good, actually? And we, then we look at the other side of the coin, of course. But uh, what does what is it good for, in your in your opinion? And you know, whatever comes to mind first. We don't need to to think too much. Yeah. See, different perspectives and using each other's strengths and skills. Yes learning from different perspectives learning from the others it's super important as well than learning just from the teacher more energy yeah <laughs> fun can be fun of course can also be challenging but it can also be fun um yeah checking blind spots again this multi-perspective deepens learning yes creating knowledge mm -hmm. Yeah, it's useful for later in life and employability, indeed. Yeah, I think those you really touched upon very, very important points uh, and advantages that I already mentioned. But uh, uh, it's it's good to 
to know that you also see it like that. Um, yeah, it also can help us learn in a different way with a bit more creativity, with the social element in it. Um, and usually in groups, you come up with things that, I mean, at least in my opinion, I, I, I have that in my experience. Uh, I might be thinking about a topic uh, individually for like weeks and I'm sort of, you know, in my bubble and I have my blind spots, but when I open it up and I uh, brainstorm with a group, you know, these blind spots are are, are uh, illuminated. And um, I really, I, I like that as well. So for me, this is a very important. So one plus one is more than two, exactly. Um, yeah, using previous knowledge and create. So really, I think it taps into this idea that that creating knowledge and learning is not a very static process, but it it happens individually, partly it happens in groups. Uh, it You can learn from the teacher, you can learn from peers. There is not one point of, you know, no one holding the universal truth, not even the teacher, actually teacher even less. So um, yeah, balancing biases indeed. So we all have to be aware and sometimes we are, sometimes it's unconscious. That's why it's called unconscious bias. Um, but again, when we work in groups, these things come out and are explicitly on the table, which is super important. Um, so yeah, it lets us get out of ourselves in a way, uh, put out, put, put, offer everything we have to offer, but also gain. And sometimes we gain more, uh, I feel. Um, so yeah, and that gives us energy. As I, I see some of you mentioned the fun, the, the social element and the energy. So yeah, thank you very much. Uh, now, of course, everything has two sides. So what do you think, again, from your experience working with collaborative learning among yourselves or with students, what are the sort of pitfalls or what do you think, not even problems, but what do you think sometimes doesn't work that well or creates obstacles, might create obstacles or something to be mindful about so that we can focus on that in, in, the, next, uh, in the next part as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The idea of free riding is always there in the back of our minds when we do collaborative learning. Yes, actually it does take more time if you want to do it properly because you need to coordinate well. Mm -hmm. The group dynamic is super important and I'm going to come back to that because it's really one of the main issues. Yeah. I like that one, assuming that everyone is able and knows how to collaborate. Indeed, often I have to explain to students why the value of collaboration and also how to do it and also train them to self-regulate as a group. I'm coming back to all those things. It's really good because all those things are actually prepared for the next slides. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really nice that you, you really mentioned that quite a lot, the, the lack of knowledge about how to collaborate. And, and this is something that we take for granted. And that's why I'm really happy that you put it here because it makes it explicit. Um, we go to the class and we think, okay, now we have a group task, a collaborative task, you work on it because you know how to work on it, right? Uh, even with first year students, even with master students, it doesn't really matter. We expect, we assume that they know how to collaborate. Um, and that's not often the case because it's a, it's a complex project uh, uh, process. So yeah, decision-making, it, it's, it's more time consuming, but also the idea of the self-regulation of the group is, and, and the, the balance between individual input and, and group output is they are very, very tricky topics. And all of them are coming back in, in, in my next slides. So this is, is, is really good primer. Um, yeah, group thing also exactly. I mean, sometimes it's good because you have different perspectives. So again, this is the side, the other side of the coin. You have different perspectives, but how about, you know, there, if there is one perspective that overpowers the others and the others are sort of just following, again, has to do with the group dynamic. Um, yeah. Group chemistry, group dynamic, yeah, it doesn't really always happen by itself. Uh, there are often issues like in our groups in real life at our jobs. So yeah, again, 
Thank you very much. This has been super interesting to see your answers. And uh, I think what I'm most happy about is uh, the fact that um, it really links very well into what I'm going to do. But yeah, so the next part, so yeah, basically the, the, the first part of the of the um, of the session on collaborative learning uh, will be focusing on exactly those issues or a lot of the issues that you mentioned um so the idea that you have to think through very well when you design for collaborative learning or design activities for collaborative learning um you have to have quite a few things how, how do you go about it so the first part will be or the first slide will be really on how to plan, what to think about, and so on. Um, then the, I will focus on a little bit on the managing the group dynamic because that those were quite a few things that you mentioned there. Um, a little bit on assessment, feedback, reflection, because these are really integral part on of collaborative learning or any learning, but of course collaborative learning as well. And there might be some pitfalls there as well. And the last part will be on technology. So, uh, sorry, I don't know why I keep doing this. So the first part is really um, planning. So this is something for you as teachers um, or for us as teachers to think about when we plan for a collaborative uh, activity. Um, and uh, as I said before, this is really, it might take a little bit longer, It, it like any uh, activity that is not, you know, more traditional. Um, and it also needs to really have a purpose. So, Linking it to the learning objectives is really super important. You start from there and uh, then try to decide on all those things. What type of task and what length of task would work best? Is it short and simple one, a more spontaneous one? Or can you reach your learning objectives only through a longer, you know, for example, a longer activity? So, for example, in a course where students have to work on a project or like even in your course here, when you work week after week on certain problems, there is a structure behind it. And then that helps you reach the final goals. So in that case, of course, the decision has to be made towards a more complex and more structured, perhaps, um, uh, activity. But these are really choices that you have to make. It's 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 often I, I see and I'm I'm training and I'm working actually together with a lot of uh, faculty. And often there's like, yeah, I, I just want some coll collaborative work there or some group work there. I say yes, but why? Because that's the first question. Why do you want it? And and then how does that help with the goals? So that guides us in how we can design it. And also ultimately how we create the groups and that's gonna be the next slide. So it really has a lot of implications. Why do we want that activity? Then if we decided that we want it, that it plays a role, it's linked to the um, uh, objectives. Also um, we decided on structure as much as necessary. Um, it's also important to think about the sequence of the course. So really thinking uh, and that you normally do anyway when you design the course or redesign the course um the sequence you know the, the 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 sequence of different modules and the different activities in the course um sometimes it's more linear sometimes it's topical like uh, yeah linear in the sense of moving from a to b to c other times it's really thematic grouping of the of the blocks or of the topics but regardless of the, that deciding where in that you know, uh, structure and sequence, your uh, uh, collaborative activity fits. Because like any activity, it has to be well linked to the things they did before, with the things they will be doing afterwards, in, or maybe the assessment, uh, and the things they will be, um, they need to deliver by the end of the course, so reaching the goals. Uh, and that is really, I think, for any learning activity, but especially for anything that's more collaborative or active, um, the integration with the rest of the course is super important. So again, it's not even the design of the task itself, it's really the integration of it within the entire course, because this will help us communicate it well and have it make sense to our students, much more than just a random set of activities that you know even we cannot really uh, say why we put them in that order and, and, and where they are, uh, and our students even less. So integration also the decision of 
another important decision is whether you assess it or not. I'm going to come back to that, but uh, that's a big decision as well. Uh, and then, of course, because we're talking about online learning, about blended learning as well, yeah, why not think about the choice of medium and modality for this activity? Uh, where will be students working together? Will they be working together only in class or do they have to work together also in between? Um, this is super important uh, uh, because some things work better in a collaborative environment online, while others are really benefiting from students seeing each other face to face. Um, so all those things, if you have a decision to, to, if you have the power of decision on those things and you are designing your course, those things are things to, to consider when you start even thinking about collaborative activities. And then of course, very important, you also have to consider your role because we haven't really touched on this uh, yet, but your our roles in the collaborative learning uh, environment are different than in a more traditional delivery sort of environment, uh, obviously. Um, but uh, it's also not a role that always comes easy. So it's more the role of a facilitator. Um, and in PBL, that is also very clear. So the tutor, the teacher is really a facilitator, uh, provides guidance, provides, provides support, uh, steers the discussion, but it's not the one providing the knowledge or, or you know, creating the knowledge by him or herself. So your role again but it's it's a little bit of a tricky one because even if it's not it might feel a bit passive because it is because you are sort of in the background guiding scaffolding supporting them facilitating the discussion but it's equally important and sometimes even more difficult to be in the background but to make sure things are working uh, well and students feel supported so again don't underestimate it um, or estimated at its right value because it might take quite a lot of time too. So beside the planning time, which is already quite big uh, or quite big, it's big anyway when we design a course, but also just thinking about how, where will we be in those activities? Are we at all in there? Do we provide feedback? Uh, do we, are, what sort of support do we provide? For instance, something you mentioned before, Supporting students in learning how to work collaboratively. Is that something we will do? Is that something we let them do? So again, all these things are really, it's a checklist of decisions and things to think about. Um, so yeah, this is the first point I wanted to make. The second point I wanted to make, and it flows from this, but also to from what you mentioned uh, in, in, uh, in Nepal, um, another really tricky issue is managing group dynamics. So because group dynamics are a little bit out of our control, right? And again, even the title is a little bit um, instigating in a way. <laughs> because are we supposed to manage that? Because didn't I just say that we should be a bit more passive? So it's a very, very fine line we are walking here between super intervening and taking away the agency from the students and making sure that they know what they need to do um, but they still do it themselves. So first thing we need to do is creating the groups. Okay, this is us, right? So we need to also think, and this links very much to what I said before, it needs to be thought through. Again, and it needs to be in relation to the point and to the aim of the task. If we want them to work, um, you know, to, to, to really um, create a very cohesive group, we have them work together in the same groups throughout the course. If we want them to, if the aim is also to work with as many people as possible and find different perspectives, then we might have them change groups every now and then. Um, if we want a very cohesive, um, you know, it, it, yeah, group, then we might look at the students' backgrounds and very purposefully create the groups like that. Other times we just wanna shuffle people around and just make, you know, see what comes up. Other times we just let them choose their own partners. Again, according to what we want from the task. Now, I'm not a big fan of letting them choose because usually in my, in my experience, they choose their friends and our friends are not always the best group work partners, but it can be. I mean, that's again, there are always exceptions. Uh, but again, according to what you want out of the task, also the way you create the groups um, or you and you have them stick or not uh, is, uh, is important. But you need to have this criteria clear in your mind uh, because also if students ask, you need to be able to say, yes, I wanted somebody with different, you know, um, uh, 
disciplines or whatever in each group, or I wanted someone, I wanted disciplinary groups, or you know, just just be able to explain why you did what you did. Now, the second part, dealing with a group dynamic, is the more tricky part, and that's where we walk this fine line, um, because we so. Uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you what I do. Some, most of the time, even though here everyone is used to having to work in groups all the time because that's the modus operandi of PBL, uh, sometimes I find that I still have to explain to students both the value of working collaboratively and in a way have time, create time for them to discuss how they want to do it. So the self-regulating uh, sort of uh, function of the group is something that I'm really trying to focus on. And a lot of people, a lot of colleagues tell me, yeah, but I cannot spend the first class only on letting them gel as groups. And then I say, yes, but actually this, if you do that in the first hour or two, they will be much better groups. And this has been shown and there is also research on that. So. Actually, this, even though we might feel is a bit outside the scope of our course and it takes away time from precious time from our course, uh, it does allow them to work better. So it can be that you do some, it doesn't have to be necessarily ice breaking or, uh, you know, team building, uh, classical team building uh, activities, um, but uh, having you know, after you discuss, after you design the groups, having the groups sit together even for an hour to discuss strengths, weaknesses, roles they want to take. Um, so really the self-regulation of the group. Um, and what I also like, and I will put a link later, uh, is um, a group charter. I don't know, maybe some of you heard of that. So it can be written, but it also can be just, you know, at least something discussed some rules that they want to apply in their own group. Again, let them come up with these things because later if something comes up, you will need to intervene and you will intervene because you need to make sure that the learning is happening, that they reach their goals, but you can always point them and hold them accountable to a certain extent uh, to the group charter. But I did notice that anytime I use that and they use that, they, they didn't need so much intervention from me because one of the students would always sort of call the others back to order. Uh, but even with that, so that's very helpful, but even with that, there are sometimes groups where one person takes, you know, overpowers the others or one or two are free riding. This is really typical issues. Um, and no matter how much they discussed, how they will work and so on, this will still happen. Uh, and then of course you need to intervene um, discreetly at first, talking to the group, um, but again, not trying to impose your own rules. Just your role is really to make sure that the learning is happening and is not disturbed uh, too much by, by uh, all the other things. Um, another thing is, for instance, and that's why I think it's important for them to discuss how the group work works or, or how they will organize themselves and for you to sort of witness that they discuss that. Because a lot of the times, a lot of people say, yes, we will work as a team and then what they do is really just divide the material uh, or divide the sort of uh, parts uh, each one does a part and then they put it together and they present it to you and there is clearly a lack of coherence um, but you know they did each their part so nobody was free riding so it's the tricky thing is that every member of the group should also be responsible for the whole output and familiar with the whole output of the group but that's very tricky there. So it's not, not easy, not easy at all. So this is something to be mindful of as well, that the, like, I think somebody was writing one plus one is more than two. Also, ideally, the output of the collaborative work is more than the sum of each individual output. But we do see that that's not often the case. So main idea here, spend time, have them spend time on discussing those things in the very beginning. My third element here is assessment and reflection. And I'm not gonna go too deep into that because of course every course is different and you have your own assessment requirements and so on. Um, bottom line here is that assessing collaborative work can be quite sensitive. Uh, and um, it's very difficult sometimes to balance, but important nevertheless, uh, to balance um, the group output with the individual inputs as well, and to give value to both, uh, because often the grade comes from the from the group output, but 
yeah, some of the, the members would maybe not are not involved or would not agree with that. Um, so what I normally do, again, very practical ex ex example, but uh, maybe you have others. I um, include some parts of individual grade as well. So it's not fully the group grade, uh, but there are some parts. It, it can be one uh, element of reflection, for instance, and here I've already bring the reflection on. So where the student in a one page or, or whatever um, reflects on the group work, and it's a good way to see in a way also how the group dynamic worked, uh, but also their own reflection on how the process went. So it has a double uh, a double function there. So I think this is really nice uh, way, but you, it can be any other element. So just having an individual element also next to the group or because it helps balance and nuance a bit uh, the final grading and assessment. But this is again, very dependent on, on your courses and, and your grading and your assessment procedures. Um, it's just the main idea is having only the group work um, assessed it can bring a lot of tension as well. Um, because the grading process can bring a lot of tension, it's always good, not only for collaborative, but in general to have to be transparent and to have rub rubrics prepared, uh, both for individual and group performance. Uh, again, this might take a lot of time to create, but they will bring a lot of added value after they are created also because when students come and contest maybe their grade, uh, you can always explain them. It's clear for you and you can make it clear for them and you can also show those things before uh, so they know what they have to work towards. Um, don't be shy of using peer assessment. Peer assessment and feedback, or maybe at least peer feedback, uh, is can be very useful as well. It can be among the people in the same group, but also in between groups. So having groups comment on each other's work. This is very good because especially the intergroup one, because it gives you, because you work in your group, so you work in a sort of bubble. But if you get at some point during the process, the chance to see what the other group is doing, it also opens up some things, you know, you see that they do something completely different. It either makes you feel good about your work, but it also might open some questions. So it's very beneficial to the project, to the um, process. The only thing with peer feedback is, a, you know, it needs to be a thought uh, or developed skill as well, because we know that the students are not always um, very knowledgeable and sensitive in giving feedback to each other. They're either super nice and not critical or very critical, um, depending on the circumstance. And so some guidance here is very, very important as well. If you use peer feedback, it's super important to also provide well, your rubrics, for instance, or tell them to look for the same criteria, uh, but give them something. That, again, is in my experience. Um, last but not least here, again, works with any activity. But for collaborative work, I think it's super important to leave space at the end for debriefing and reflection. Again, like we left space in the beginning for group formation, it's also very important for us as groups, but also as a class to debrief, to see how it worked, what worked, what didn't, also to reflect individually and as a group, a written, verbal, on post-its, um, anonymous, whatever. The important is the idea of debriefing and reflection and creating the space for it. Because we all know that the class finishes all too quickly, everyone runs out, uh, but this, is a learning process and it needs to be, you know, the loop needs to be closed and it's usually closed with reflection. And the last point here is technology. Uh, here, of course, uh, I have two slides. So the first one is really focusing more on how technology can really help the collaborative work process very practically. Uh, so your students, again, I, as I mentioned before, the choice of modality is some, also something uh, that you need to think from the beginning. Maybe. All of it takes place online. Um, maybe only parts of it take place online, but nevertheless, there are some tools that intrinsically can help with the collaborative process. And this is collaborative writing. So basically tools like Google Docs and, and wikis and um, uh, Padlets and all these things. Um, and also because you need to do quite a bit of project management, uh, in a way, when you have group work, at least group management, um, uh, also project management tools uh, can also help a lot in scheduling meetings, keeping track of things, um, so like teams and stuff like that. Uh, but again, students can also come up with their own tools. It's just a matter of just, you know, thinking about 
tools that can help them uh, regardless if they work online or face to face. Um, and why I chose these things is because, and why I think it's important to use technology and, and, and such tools here is because they help us capture the process and not only the outcome. And this links back to grading and to assessing and to feedback. With collaborative learning, I, I like to look at the final output, but I also really am interested in how the process took place. And there are not that many ways to capture the process unless for you know collaborative writing or uh, discussion forums and stuff like that. So it, it gives us a peek into the workspace of the students. So again, depends on the platform, but this is super important because I, 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 I see a bit of the process as well um, and not only the final project that comes with it. But technology more generally, so reflecting, taking a step back and thinking about how technology can help, and this also, by the way, fits with the next slide on, on learning community, um, are um, really helps us both connect and facilitate learning. So connect, I don't even need to mention it because this is what connects our, us all here, um, connecting with practitioners, connecting different universities, creating these networks, um, increasing accessibility for remote learners, uh, but also connecting at a more, um, let's say content level, connecting theory, practice, um, yeah, integrating all those things. Um, but also technology can help us facilitate learning uh, with providing support, scaffolding for students, developing online media literacy skills. They're also important. Uh, again, they might seem like a side product, byproduct of all these things, uh, but they are there. And as I said in the beginning, sometimes we don't focus enough or we don't make it explicit enough you know, what skills our students develop through these learning processes, collaborative or individual. So technology really, and again, this is more a reflective uh, um, uh, prompt for you also in the future, can really help us uh, quite a lot in our learning and in our teaching. But I will stop for now. And I just wanted to check if you have any questions related to this part, strictly on collaborative learning. Because the next two slides are really to finish up our own learning communities. But if you have something particular on the things I just talked about, like learning design related. No? Okay, then we leave some space and then for the discussion at the end. Um, okay, so as I said, we're gonna talk about two things today. So the next thing is, um, actually I should have stopped, yeah. Um, the next thing are learning communities. So I have again a question for you and you might still have it open, um, I hope, uh, the WOOC lab. Um, and the next question is, in a word, or a short phrase, not very long though, uh, what is a learning community for you? What does it bring? What is it? How do you define it in a way or, or conceptualize it? I just want to start again from your definitions because, you know, then we move into mine. But last time they coincided quite a bit. Sense of identity, yes, very important. Good to start with that. Connected, working on the same topic, support, peer support. It's a journey, yes, communication, goals, a group of like-minded people, yes. Working on the same topic, yes. So basically this idea of being on the same wavelength, either topic-wise or similar interests or, you know, like-minded. I, I like that idea, shared interest. Less grading for the teacher, I like that as well. <laughs> Uh, it links a bit to the peer peer uh, grading and peer feedback that I just mentioned. Shared learning goals. The idea here is also sharing, shared, shared goals. Communication. Yes. Um, peer support. Safe learning space. I like that. Probably should have not done 
uh, word cloud here, but we make sense of what is there. <laughs> Uh, so shared learning goals, shared interest, a safe learning space. I really, really like that. Um, peer support, sense of identity, like-mindedness. Yeah. Communication plays a very important role there. Being connected with the others, learning. Yeah, I think you mentioned all the buzzwords, definitely. So uh, we are we are there. Um Thank you so much. This uh, this is really useful because it leads very well into what I had in mind as describing a learning community. Um, and this is actually, yes, a space for reflective practitioners, but it can also be for students um, as reflective practitioners, because that's in the end what we also try to train them to be, at least in my view, uh, to exchange and crowdsource source ideas uh, and support each other in their practice. So maybe it's a bit of a more a broader definition, but what you mentioned there, shared goals, like-mindedness, um, a safe space, all those things are really fitting into this very, very well. Safe space, you see, I also mentioned it there. Validation that also comes from like-minded people. Of course, it also comes from people that are not like-minded, but we can open up that discussion. Um, is the learning community really creating a bubble? And are we having enough interactions with who is outside the bubble? So there are quite some thoughts popping up there. Um, crowdsourcing, so working together towards a goal, so a shared goal, um, but also accountability, keeping each other accountable for reaching those goals. So we kind of need all those things. I think those are basic needs that we have as professionals, uh, but also that our students have when they work in groups uh, or in small communities. Now, I have to say, I don't have that much experience with um, having students worked in communities. It's more like they work in their groups, but I would more put it in our first um, part of the session, collective uh, collaborative working. Um, uh, co yeah, collaborative learning and working. Uh, but um, I do have quite a bit of experience uh, with uh, faculty learning communities. Uh, and this is in a way one of them, the one you're part of. Um, and that's because, so I'll move a little bit here from uh, my teaching mind and using coll collaborative learning with our students towards our my towards my faculty developer hat. Um, so here I'm gonna, yeah, I'm focusing really on on what we can do as uh, faculty and educational developers to support and why the faculty learning communities are super important. Um, and those can be, of course, very different. Uh, they can be institution-based, they can be department-based, even if you want to have really people from your discipline um, or even sub discipline uh depends how small and how niche you want the, co the community to be or they can go broader like like your community uh cross um countries and uh obviously cross disciplines as well uh and then you really um uh, use the diversity and the heterogeneity in your work uh so both of them are equally valid i think to have both is could be a ideal goal uh but there are some some issues I've noticed at least, uh, and again, it's nice to finish on this note because I, I think you might have some thoughts because of working uh, or yeah, learning and working in this way. Um, and I have some thoughts and reflections uh, based on my work at, at different universities and why this is a little bit more difficult uh, to, to create and to nurture. Uh, because first of all, it really takes, well, it takes uh, initiative, but it also takes a bit more time to form. Most of the time, these communities will not just, you know, form automatically, everyone will click, people will be happy, will meet regularly and so on. So it takes quite a bit of work, persuasion, um, uh, after a while it becomes self-evident for the ones that are in there that it's useful, but not from the for the ones outside. So I would always maybe have this uh, approach, bring a friend next time so that people get socialized with this idea and maybe they find it useful. So it grows slowly. But for many of us in many universities, this is too slow. Like you often, and I tried different things. I tried more formal, more informal, uh, coffee every uh, third Thursday of the month, uh, breakfast, uh, cookies, um, you know, online exchanges, two, three people show up and then that's it. Uh, so 
it's very, especially within institutions that I can talk from, from the intra-institutional ones. So it can be quite frustrating and we often give up. I gave up many times, maybe far too early. But then when I was in the US last year, and I was looking at different types of educational development uh, provisions there, a lot of the universities actually during the pandemic started learning communities at the desire of the, of the, of the faculty actually. Um, and even though the ones I participated in or observed were not huge ones, sometimes they were like eight or 10 people, but the level of discussions were amazing. It was amazing because they re, you could really feel the trust that has been built in that community. And I think that's the defining element. So it was really, really nice to see that. Um, and yeah, it made me think that maybe I should have a bit more patience and help uh, create or, or support those communities. And they can play different roles. So peer learning, again, we learn from each other. Mentoring, it can be mentoring from a more experienced to a less experienced, but sometimes also reverse mentoring. We can learn a lot also from less uh, experience or you know entry level uh, faculty. Uh, team teaching and co-teaching, again, something that is super important, but a lot of universities don't do it because of university of, of yeah, regulations, uh, time and so on. Um, just observing, shadowing colleagues is super important as well, or even exchanging syllabi, um, co-creating resources for the courses. It sometimes it goes hand in hand with the, with the co-teaching, but still, even without it, just co-creating things. Um, it can be really, as I said, national, international, cross-disciplinary, um, and I find technology really, really, really helpful uh, for this. Uh, so I, I, I see so many benefits in creating these communities, regardless how small and how local uh, they are, they, uh, or how global then they are. Um, but I really would like to hear more from you on both topics, collaborative learning and learning networks, and also if you have any questions. So I'll stop sharing now. And thank you for your attention because that was a long, uh, a long talk. <laughs> yes. I don't know who was first, but uh, Luis? Alexandra, Luis. Oh, I clapped my hands. Thank oh, you. You clapped. Okay. <laughs> but if somebody has raised a hand, then yeah. I clap too. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> but this is a moment to ask questions. I will send a presentation, and I will also maybe send a list of resources. And uh, but I think I added already some resources to to what you already have. So yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. And you are all, all welcome at Maastricht University to witness uh, problem-based learning. Yes, Lena. <laughs> hey, um, so since you were mentioning um, this problem that happens in many groups that instead of really collaborating, they split the work into parts and then bring it back together. Um, and you were acknowledging this as a mm -hmm. common problem and um, said that we have to take care uh, and, and, and think about this. Do you mm -hmm. have ideas um, how, to, how to deal with this, um, how to mitigate this strategy? Yeah, thank you so much. This is, a, I, I was sure somebody will ask to be more precise there. Uh, and I'm still developing ideas for that, to be honest, because this is, again, you don't want to intervene too much when the group is forming and deciding on their roles. Um, but I'm, I, because I noticed far too much that uh, they seem to be working very well. And then in the end, I saw the output was really just a collection. Um, yeah. I thought, okay, let's look a bit deeper into that. Uh, and one thing I, 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 um, I, one interesting thing is really a tool in a way is uh, different roles in the group. And normally I would let people choose their roles. One of them leads a discussion, one of them uh, writes up, one of them will present, or, you know, different roles. Um, but I would say um, what I try now is to make them aware, of course, of the problem from the beginning, from the onset, when we discuss about the, pro uh, the, the project uh, or the activity, and also try to... Um, advise them, but again, without being too directive, because I don't want to get too involved, but um, advise them 
to think differently about the roles. So maybe to have a student take more transversal roles rather than just topics. So, or, or that they each have to revise each other's topics. So what I want to ensure is that everyone will have read things through as a, as a, as a whole, rather than just send that to one person and one person collates them. Mm. At least that would be suffi sufficient. At least that everyone you know, can still have comments on the whole piece. So again, that could be done through more transversal roles rather than just, you know, everyone has their part. Um, uh, roles that would involve a little bit of back and forth between the people rather than everyone working in their homes and sending stuff at the end. But it's a tricky question because you don't want to prescribe the structure. You want them to, to, to choose it, uh, mm -hmm. but you also want to avoid this problem because also this is the more comfortable way for them to work. Uh, they don't have to meet too much. Everyone will do their parts and then somebody will collate it and that person will probably know more about the topic. But for the rest, uh, and also when they present, by the way, then they each present their parts, of course. So it's really reinforcing. So thinking about the topic in a different way than just cutting it and chopping it in parts. But uh, but yeah, it can only be a suggestion. I, I, I never enforced it like really you need to, but uh, yeah. And I'm still thinking about ways. So this is not a not a final. <laughs> Did you have like preliminary results on on this already? I think just anecdotally, when I mentioned this, it they become aware because I think they it it links back to what most of you said in the poll that people don't really know how to work collaboratively. So mm -hmm. it's like they imagine oh collaboratively we will split tasks and it's collaborative, right? So mm -hmm. I think the most important part is actually this beginning, this first hour or two hours where they discuss those things. Um, so generally, because I made this part of that two hours, I feel like whenever this discussion takes place, the, the work, the output is better and the whole process is smooth. But it doesn't, it doesn't mean that for all the groups, it will be like this because one element that we cannot control is really the group dynamic and the personalities in the group. And that works for PBL, that works for any type of collaborative activity. It can get really frustrating. You try your best and then because of the people in the group, somehow it will work differently in every case, better or worse. So I don't think, and I, I didn't do really systematic research on it either. But all I can say is that whenever that happened, uh, whenever they really had this discussion seriously in the beginning, uh, they were more prepared for 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 delivering good work. Thank you. I was just thinking about the accountability part. Mm -hmm. Would you say that it would be one way to um, present it that they you sort of randomly decide who's going to present it, and they have to get all the information to be the, their own in some way? Yes, this could definitely be one way as well. Yeah, that's a that's that's a good that's an interesting point. Making things or making sure that. Yeah, exactly. It's one way of making sure that everyone um, has a good mastery of the final output. And that will involve them having to really uh, take ownership and not just of their part. Uh, that, that, yeah, that, it's an interesting one. I'll, I'll try to think about that one. Yeah. <laughs> or one has to answer the questions, for instance, you know? Because the questions can be from um, from other groups or from me, they can be in totally different topics, and that person, you know, so gi giving these sort of new roles that that, uh, um, yeah. But we have to be careful because you don't want to force too much into their dynamic, but but you want to make sure that those things are done in the end. You know, it's uh, that that's the balance I think we're fighting with the collaborative work. Yes. <laughs> Now we have uh, one minute uh, for questions. <laughs> and uh, yeah, if not, thank you very much uh, for your input. I think it's always good to have a repetition about what is collaboration and learning communities. And uh, I think you, you gave us a, a very good uh, overview about this. So thank you very much for your thank thoughts. Thank you, your it was a pleasure. Yes, and um, yeah, maybe you will stay some minutes uh, after yeah. the webinar. So yeah, but and good luck to everyone with the with the group work <laughs> and yeah. for the uh, rest of the course. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.
thank you very much and uh, have a good day and uh, have fun with the rest of the ONL course. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Bye. <laughs>